yeah, I think we are, we have quite many connected to this uh, webinar, this workshop that we are organizing from the Foundation of Subsidiarity, Subsidiarity Foundation, uh, based on Milan, but connected now in different parts of the world. So welcome, welcome everyone here, and um, the pleasure to chair this meeting that was organized some time ago by a group of, of people, Giorgio Vitadini, Alberto Brugnoli, Gian Maria Martini, and myself and some others. We wanted to organize this uh, in order to continue the series of seminars and workshops we started some time ago. We had some meetings in Rimini, uh, we had a meeting in Milano, I remember. Uh, I remember Professor Foloni was in one of them. Um, Samuele Rosa from IMF was also in, participating in another seminar in Milano, uh, no, in Rimini at that time. Uh, we wanted to do another one, this time virtual, of course. It's a pity that we cannot meet e each other in, in face to face in person, but, but I think we can also profit to have this more diffusion of. of and more participants from different parts of the world by doing this virtual. Um, and just I wanted to, before starting, I want to just to remember a little bit what is the goal of this encounter, this uh, seminar that we, now is number four uh, that we are organizing today. So the goal is, is, is really to look at the economic reality from, from the perspective really uh, we, uh, we want no. It's, it's, it's not. It's not just uh, to. It's to. We want to have a better understanding of what's going on in the world with a lot of economic and social challenges uh, around us, especially now after the COVID-19 uh, disease the spread all over the world. We have even more challenges than before, um, and we, in order to, to to understand also what's going on and what can be the the. the Respond the, the societal response to this. We really want to be together to help each other and to help others. Uh, for uh, look at the, the socioeconomic reality from a real human perspective, for a human, real human, a fully human uh, dimension. What does it mean? Does it mean that we want to go beyond the homo economicus uh, classical paradigm that is still alive in many many of the in many areas in many, in many institutions and in, in, yeah. in many people we want to go beyond that to uh, excuse me can you can you all mute your macros and your <laughs> and your uh, also even in order to have a better better communication uh, and then if you need any any assistance you can also write it in the chat to the to the Fundazione per la Subsidiarità, and then you can get in direct contact with the organizers in order to, to solve any kind of problem or uh, technical problem or any other kind of issue. So thank you. So uh, the idea then is to, to think beyond the traditional way of thinking that we, we learn in the faculties of economics and business administrations and in many other faculties uh, and, it's, and now it's really that paradigm is really no, not useful any, anymore, especially now after the, this, this pandemic we are suffering. You cannot start doing business with others without a previous question about who are you, how are you, how are your relatives, how are your family, how do you feel about this, how do you feel about the, what's going on. So it's, there is a real need to now to have a connection with people and with before starting talking about business. And the business itself needs to have this kind of human side as well. They are not. So uh, we are not alone in this. We also sometimes quote in the Nassan Nobel Prizes that are also sharing this kind of uh, approach we want to, to go uh, to, like for example, the uh, Arrow or, or Stiglitz or Hitzman or Thaler or Tiro or Akerlof. The Tirol, for example, was saying just a few years ago that the economy is at the service of a common good to achieve a better world. A common good. So we are here about to talk about also a common good that is this kind of a, a area of sustainability, green economy, green recovery. So this is an area in which is kind of a common, a common good able to do a, a better world. And now, and here we have a perhaps unexpected protagonist to do this, that is Europe. 
Europe was, was not able to agree to what to do after, uh, after the last crisis, economic and financial crisis in 2008. Now, I, Europe has agreed to do something, agreed to do something to as Europe. So really, I, under this, this topic of Green Deal, Green uh, Recovery, really we want to understand what's going on in Europe, what happened, why Europe is taking this, what, why, which are the, what is be, be, behind this, and what, what are the implications of this. And for, uh, and for this topic that I think is really very important uh, to understand the economic movements today and the policy action from Europe, we have an excellent uh, panel of three speakers here that I will introduce you. So first is Ricardo Rivera de Alcala, is the Director General in Digital Internal Policies at the European Parliament. So really, we very well, it's very honored to have him on board and also to have uh, his European flag uh, uh, behind his, <laughs> his uh, office that we can see at least a European flag here in this <laughs> in these screens we are watching now. Um, uh, so then we have uh, Carlo Altomonte, Professor of Economics of European Integration from the University uh, Bocconi in Milano, uh, expert on European Affairs. And we also have a uh, third speaker, Fernando Valera, Director of Social Work. Uh, and this is, is a very interesting initiative that you will hear about. Uh, he is also co-director of a, 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 a master innovation course on social innovation. So all about also about uh, social actors moving in this in this uh, possible new economy coming from the debate we are going to to have now. So I will this the way we have decided to organize this is very simple. We'll have just interventions. Uh, from each of the three speakers between 15 and 20 minutes each in order to have half an hour for final discussion interaction among us with uh, so you all are invited to participate and to raise your hand and have a, a reaction or question or whatever you want uh, in the way to interact so the first inter intervention will be from Ricardo Rivera I will ask him about why Europe has decided to move in this direction how would this was possible? Uh, then how the situation, how is the situation so far? So is, is, is really moving in the right path or not? It's maybe blocked by, because it's, I suppose it's not very easy to move. Uh, and what, which are the challenges for a right implementation of this program, this uh, action? That we are, when we talk about Green Deal, a green, green Recovery, we also wanted to have a link with the Next Generation program and the 2021-2027 EU budget and, and policies related. So it's, it's a little bit the whole action that Bureau is taking the lead. Now, how do you how do you see all this all this, Ricardo? Eh, Ricardo, sorry. Sentiamo, Ricardo. Ah. Yes, I was I was muted indeed. Um, uh, thank you very much for your introduction. And also, I'd like to thank also the Foundation for Subsidiarity to having uh, proposed the discussion and exchange of this uh, of this issue. Uh, I, um, from during my presentation, indeed, I will try to address at least part of the questions which have been now raised by Professor Rualcava, by Luis, um, and I will do with the support of some slides which I'm now uh, sharing. Um, first of all, um, the Europe, what is the European Green Deal? It is essentially is a roadmap towards sustainability and green transition, which aims to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Um, as defined by Mark Gardner, the author of the uh, book uh, entitled Ethical Tragedy of Climate Change. Uh, in some ways, the climate change is a perfect moral storm as its impacts does no borders as it goes beyond limits of space, but also goes beyond the limits of times because it has huge influence in the subsequent generations. And around this, it's also part of a certain uncertainty about the effects. We know a lot of effects today, 
of the climate change. We don't know what would be additional effects and also explanations on the precise causes uh, which have uh, explanation has sometimes varied. However, I would say that there are now some elements um, um, making uh, urgent uh, decision, uh, also a um, policy action at the level of the uh, European Union, but also of our countries. Uh, the first one is the scientific evidence. There is now unchallenged consensus among experts. Um, it's set out also by the panel of intergovernmental panel on climate change, IPCC, concerning the effects of the global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade compared to the pre-industrial time, and also the disastrous effect which an increase of only two degrees might have on our environment. Afterwards, there is an issue of public perception. We have conducted in the European Union some public opinion survey as we used to do quite regularly. And we see what you can see in the slides, that 95% of the European consider that protection of the environment is important, as we know. 77% consider that it can boost the economic growth. And 36% of the uh, interviewed also consider that the European Union, the budget of the European Union should be used to combat climate change. Also important part of the uh, number of uh, respondents, they also say that they consider that the uh, young, uh, young people, youth led climate action protests had an important impact on the EU uh, policy. There is also another reflection, which can also contribute to change the mind of the people of the, let's say, uh, European people. And this is offered by uh, Jeremy Rifkin when he considers that uh, a shared sense of vulnerability and empathy represents an important leverage to achieve the dramatic change. Indeed, he considers that in the modern era, the modern era, we had mostly a model which was based very much on utilitarian mind, a kind of acquisitive nature. And therefore, to put the material progress, uh, let's say, as uh, the key uh, considered to, as a key dream, but in the global area, in the area where we are now, he considered that frailty and vulnerability become humanity's universal condition. And empathy is the new social glue, and also believes that Europe has a special role to play as it has proved greater sensitivity to global risk, more human-centered social attitude in comparison, for example, with the exacerbated urge for material progress uh, and pursuit of self-interest uh, or individual autonomy of America, for example. But it's also another important aspect is the, let's say what I can call the uh, spiritual reference. This is offered by Laudato Si uh, encyclical. Just I, I mentioned here some of this, uh, some key points of this uh, encyclical, which indeed represents really a cornerstone in addressing the environmental ch challenges in their overall anthropological, economic, social, spiritual dimension in line with the best tradition of the social teaching of the church. Indeed, Pope Francis talks about integral economy, ecology, uh, which is uh, made up of a simple daily gesture, uh, which break the logic of violence, exploitation and selfishness and also the uh, exacerbated consumption, consumption uh, uh, mind in the world. And also what is interesting that everything is connected. And the ecology is considered the science of relationship because the aim, its aim is to establish harmony with ourselves, with others, with other living creatures and for the believers sure with God. 
Um, therefore, the Laudato Si, far from me being, let's say, ecological, uh, very often it's presented as kind of ecological in Sikh movement. Indeed, it's much more. It's about the human being. Uh, it's to construct a new human subject, uh, which is capable of taking care of the creation, taking care of the others. And as no ecology exists, can exist without anthropology. Um, the encyclical also fosters a new economic model, which is not based only on maximization of the profit, but also and also on, let's say, an unsustainable exploitation of the, uh, our uh, resources. I just mentioned very shortly in the slides some other important points. The uh, ecological debt, the notion of ecolog ecological debts not only between North and South, but also between uh, generations, the need to uh, uh, adopt a legal framework to uh, address this question, but also a, a warning, uh, what let's say uh, the encyclical calls the cheerful recklessness of suggesting that things are not serious and let's say to continue like, uh, like this uh, for a long time, but uh, the Pope warns that this kind of evasiveness serves as a license to carry out, to bring to our self-destructive lifestyle. Um, as you know, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the deal, the Green Deal was not new. It was preceded by certain roadmap, I just in the in slide, uh, remind some of these uh, key uh, moment. Uh, 1972, the United Nations first major conference in Stockholm, after the Kyoto Protocol and the Breakthrough Paris Agreement in 2015, which for, was the first universal legally binding climate deal. You know, let's say where the commitment has been taken to uh, make sure that the, the temperature global warming can uh, remain below two degrees uh, centigrade. And also we had in 2015, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, identifying some key sustainability development goals. Now, the European Green Deal uh, is a result therefore of scientific evidence and political developments and change maybe in mind of the people increasing concern with the European citizens and all represented, uh, all this represented a platform uh, backing uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, project, uh, which was announced during her political uh, guidelines to uh, launch this very ambitious uh, strategy. Therefore, the European Green Deal become uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, um, the key important mission for the European uh, Union, uh, which has been even by the president of the European Commission has been compared to the uh, moon landing moment, uh, or the Europe's man on the moon moment, uh, say the landing of the, uh, of the man on the moon, just to, to indicate what we did to this uh, dramatic change we represent. Uh, the deal has different, uh, let's say, components, which I will uh, try to uh, describe in short. Um, this is a kind of very encompassing, all-encompassing uh, concept. Uh, the basic idea to reconcile the economy and growth with the environment and protection of the planet. It is also the catalyst for an inclusive and non-discriminatory social transition since the damage done by, to our planet is affecting especially the poor in our world, in our society. Um, in uh, his book on the uh, New Green Deal, uh, Rifkin uh, also uh, talks about the col collapse of the fossil uh, fuel civilization, um, adding that we are now ahead of a new uh, industrial uh, revolution, which will be built on the uh, falling of the renewables, combined with the fast technological development, bringing digitalization, internet of things, artificial intelligence into industry and our everyday life. 
Um, the energy sector is one of the, the most important is uh, the uh, reduction of use of, uh, of uh, energy, um, of fossil energy is one of the key features because the uh, energy consumption accounts for more than 75% of the EU greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, the purpose here is to um, uh, the energy sector uh, should be in future, should be clean, secure, affordable, and it must be based mostly on renewable resources and in uh, parallel fossil sources need to be phased out. Industry, industrial sector has very important role to play in terms of transformation, should be based on the concept of circular economy, bringing in hope to the increasing extraction of raw materials by raising the use of recycled materials in production, producing more sustainable products. This process is supported by the EU industrial strategy and the new circular economy action plan. Other important point uh, area is the construction. Buildings accounts for 40% of energy consumed and also there the plan is to embark a very ambitious renovation wave which will result in lower energy bills potentially also contributed to reducing the energy power. The transport, transport accounts for 25% of EU greenhouse gas emissions. It's also a, a key uh, area. Therefore, we have to much be prepared to changes for road, rail, aviation, uh, water, uh, ways, transport, which will contribute to this uh, reduction. Agriculture, agriculture already has contributed to the reduction of greenhouse emissions starting since 2099. However, still it accounts for more than 10% of the emissions. Therefore, the Green Deal is accompanied by a new agricultural strategy, the common agricultural policy and farm to fork, farm to fork strategy, which will guarantee a fair, healthy, environmentally friendly food system while ensuring farmers' livelihoods. Uh, therefore, these are, let's say, the key um, uh, policy which are, uh, let's say, concerned, but it's clear that Green Deal will, will, affect, will have an impact on all other uh, policies, sectoral policies of the European Union. What are the tools to achieve this? One is, it, European climate law. This is the legal instrument to achieve climate neutrality and to turn the political commitment into legal obligations in a European climate law. The centerpiece of the Green Deal will enshrine the goal to reach net zero emissions in 2015 into, uh, into law. I'd like to uh, mention that the European Parliament has adopted very recently its position on the European climate law and has increased the target until 60%, let's say, increase the emissions reduction target to 16% for 2030 instead of uh, the 55% which was uh, mentioned, uh, which has, was proposed by the European Commission. The second important pillar is the European, Cl European Climate Pact. The pact is to encourage broad societal engagement in the road to climate centrality by bringing together regions, local communities, civil society and industry from individuals to the largest uh, multinationals. Um, third important feature is the Just Transition Fund, uh, because uh, we need to support the uh, structural changes in business models in our society, uh, also in the skill requirements, and it is necessary therefore to accompany it. Uh, this, therefore, this Just Transition Fund will support the people in the region most affected by the low carbon uh, transition and um, in 
will focus in particularly on the regions and sectors that are most affected by the transition because they depend on fossil fuels, on carbon or more carbon intensive processes. Therefore, it is also an important uh, element to uh, address also, let's say, the social impact and regional impact of this uh, transformation. In terms of the impact on uh, um, the economy of the, the finance, it's clear that all this needs to be uh, supported uh, by a very ambitious investment plan to mobilize public and private funding towards the objective of the just transition, which is uh, supported by a sustainable Europe investment plan. You will see it in the in the slides, indeed, this investment plan is based on different aspects, let's say. First one, mobilizing funding at least on one by one trillion uh, euros from the EU budget in the next decade, uh, putting sustainability at the heart of the investment and providing support to public administrations and public promoters to create a robust pipeline or sustainable uh, projects. Therefore, in terms of uh, budget, the European Parliament, the EU, you find here all these different budget uh, sources. And one of the most important is, is, the, is the, uh, the multi-annual financial framework, let's say the, uh, the budget of the uh, European Union. And in this framework, when the, the European Parliament has uh, ensured has requested that at least 30% of the total amount of the union budget and the next generation EU, the other important project, which has been launched for the COVID, to address the COVID, the 30% should support climate objectives. And seven by 8%, which address in particular uh, biodiversity. In this framework, an important tool is the, uh, represented by what we call taxonomy regulation. Indeed, it's about identifying the uh, main areas to lay down criteria under which an economic activity can be labeled as environmental sustainable. I just mentioned there some of the uh, conditions which should be filled in order to get this labeling, let's say, should address the climate change, the sustainable use, protection of water, um, the transition to circular economy, prevention of pollution, and so and so on. Um, but we are talking not only about uh, Green Deal, uh, we are um, also uh, talking about uh, COVID recovery and green recovery. Therefore, um, as you know, the Green Deal was not conceived to address the COVID challenge. Therefore, COVID represented an absolutely dramatic new development, um, uh, dramatic for the life of uh, our uh, economy, affecting uh, the life of our citizens, industry, trade, services, with huge unforeseen re re um, repercussions. Therefore, it has been, it's been necessary to uh, launch this ambitious recovery plan. Uh, but uh, in this framework, uh, the idea is to undertake the huge economic ecological transformation at the same time when the, our economy is suffering for this unprecedented health crisis. This is a challenge because in the moment we are, uh, let's say, facing a dramatic uh, crisis, I think the idea is to undertake how we can continue, however, with this ambitious project of uh, to uh, enforce this digital transformation. The answer by the European uh, Union in this respect um, has been that this crisis should, be, rep should represent an opportunity and put climate change uh, objective at the heart of the recovery package of the important mobilization of, uh, of funds uh, which has been uh, foreseen. We know that uh, real GDP uh, was being uh, projected to fall by 8% in 2020, 
uh, we will have the romantic effect of our uh, economy. Therefore, uh, the idea of the uh, let's say next generation EU plan mobilizing uh, 750 billion uh, euros uh, exactly should uh, um, address this question by raising fund, funds on the capital market on behalf of the uh, EU. Uh, the European Union and sure the other pillar I've mentioned it already is multi-annual financial framework of the uh, European uh, European uh, Union. But in this uh, framework, um, say it will be a recovery plan, recovering a resilient facility, which is the key feature of the recovery plan, the new generation plan, um, implies that renovation of buildings, uh, infrastructure, renewable energy projects should be at the core of the new uh, actions will be financed. It means the plan, the new plans, which be, must be launched by our national authorities should cover this area, should address renovation of buildings, renewable projects, uh, energy projects, uh, digitalize services, industry, and so on. Biodiversity, I don't uh, I just mentioned it, it's also a very important uh, component, but in order to do all this, you need resources. Therefore, it's clear that it was not possible to afford these uh, enormous challenges with teeny EU multi-annual budgets, which amount to 1,070 uh, billion euros for seven years. Therefore, was uh, Ricardo, would you yes. mind to would you mind to conclude because we are a little bit out of, out of time now? Absolutely, I'm sorry. Uh, sure, I think therefore it's uh, um, is clear it was necessary. Just I mentioned that we needed new additional resources, and the European Parliament has requested a new carbon border adjustment mechanism, and emission trading scheme will be uh, the new. Uh, say more the new uh, uh, resources. Just uh, to, uh, to conclude um, that uh, recovery and resilience facility um, should uh, be uh, drawn based on multilateral dialogue with local authorities, social partners, civil society organizations. Therefore, the moment the green transition, the green deal is also the moment of subsidiarity. And also, not only, let's say, vertical subsidiarity we have been using already, environment was the, uh, historically, was the first area where so, uh, subsidiarity was applied, but also subsidiarity in terms of involving the civil society in decisions. It's been one of the key requests also of the European Parliament when uh, dealing with this uh, project. Uh, to conclude, the European deal, therefore, is not single action, is very en encompassing concept, uh, having huge implication for a, an economic uh, model. Um, it outlines a, a map, but it's also a bet, because, yeah, because in order to, it will also require a profound change in the minds. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I'm being too long. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ricardo, for this excellent presentation of the of the action of the of the, all of this related to the Green Deal. Really has been very, very informative and illustrative. So I would like now to to pass the floor to, uh, to Carlo, um, to Yasa, to Monte. Just to you, you can just tell us a little bit your views, and especially you can focus on a little bit more on the of the economic background of this move of this action. What is the direction that Europe wants to go uh, if this is really kind of you know it's, it's, it's not an inertia it's something that is really something that has arrived um we don't know if it's due to kind of more interventionist uh, uh, movement or is more against the liberal liberal thing before or is is well, what is the direction you think europe is going go in this now uh Okay. Sorry, there's an, the, uh, I, rem I, I remind you that if it's, it's good if you can be on mute, all of you, so we don't interfere with uh, 
while you are not talking, so you don't interfere with the with the communication. Thank you, Carlo. Your your floor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Luis, and thanks uh, for to the Fondazione per la Sussidiarietà for having invited me. Uh, I would like to share my screen. I have uh, just a few slides uh, to discuss with you. Uh, I hope you can see them. Um, good. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, thank you also to, to Ricardo for uh, the very nice and informative presentation because really, uh, in the usual crisp way Ricardo explained things, uh, uh, it has really uh, told us about uh, what the, the Green Deal uh, uh, is all about, uh, what, what is the plan and how it's going to be accomplished. What I would like to do with you today is to give you a bit of a background of how the Green Deal has emerged as a key policy for the EU at a time where COVID was not yet uh, one of the challenges. And I will try also to discuss to what extent uh, the COVID shock uh, uh, is consistent uh, with this plan. And to a certain extent, unfortunately, it is quite consistent uh, with what Europe already had in mind uh, at the start uh, of uh, the new von der Leyen Commission in July uh, 2019, when, of course, uh, clearly COVID uh, was not on the horizon. So uh, the starting point, uh, uh, I think, is uh, the evolution of uh, uh, the EU economy over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, essentially, the EU is uh, the only continent that has seen uh, a, a double dip after the great financial crisis. Uh, the first dip uh, is common to every country in the world. This V-shaped uh, crash in 2009 followed by sudden recovery in 2010 is common to virtually every economy in the world. It's a symmetric shock even in magnitude four to five percentage points of GDP. This is essentially what you observe in the US, in Japan, in China, and so on. Uh, so uh, clearly not every economy lands on minus five, uh, but the size of the shock is, is similar to for every country. However, Europe was the only continent in the world that experienced a second uh, shallower but longer recession in 2012 in 2013 as a result of its internal inconsistencies in dealing with the financial crisis, so essentially the bank crisis and the debt crisis that emerged after the type of responses that we were obliged to give to the great financial crisis, mainly relying on the fact that we didn't have a, a centralized fiscal tool uh, to deal uh, with uh, the asymmetric shock of the crisis in certain banking systems. Uh, once we put in place that fiscal tool, namely the European uh, uh, stability mechanism, then uh, uh, Mr. Draghi could utter his words on July 27th of what uh, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro uh, after the political agreement on the European stability mechanism. Otherwise, that words would have been non-compliant with uh, the treaty. And then uh, clearly, uh, all that followed was a clear change in uh, the policy orientation of the EU, uh, expensive monetary policy, some support from fiscal policy, the new Juncker Commission with the management of demand through the financial uh, strategic initiative. Uh, so essentially the uh, Juncker plan that uh, managed to stimulate investment, essentially Europe has had very good uh, uh, five to six years of economic expansion uh, from 2014 to the end of 2019. However, uh, it was clear that uh, this model was uh, about to end. So what you see here is a forecast of 2020, which clearly does not incorporate COVID, but uh, that's a forecast that more likely line was a downward trend in terms of growth rate and some signals were already there that uh, the EU economic model uh, was already under threat uh, uh, in 2019. Uh, why? For a very simple reason. If you look at uh, uh, what EU had accomplished over time, was essentially building a way out of the crisis, relying on an export-led uh, uh, EU growth model. On a voluntary basis, if you look at the experience of Germany, uh, the core EU having a substantial current account, uh, so a current uh, positive surplus in terms of GDP, uh, as you see, uh, and therefore uh, an export-led, if you want, EU growth model. Uh, and uh, the rest of the EU, the country under uh, an assistance program, so 
Portugal, Ireland, Greece, uh, Spain, Cyprus, and also Italy, because of the austerity imposed uh, on uh, uh, during the crisis, essentially having to go through internal devaluations, uh, compressing costs and wages, which led to regaining of competitiveness and therefore uh, export-led growth. If you look at the drivers of growth, for example, for Italy in 2016, 2017, which were among the highest ever recorded uh, since, uh, or possibly the highest recorded after the financial crisis, uh, these growth rates were essentially sustained by exports. So uh, Europe was growing through exports uh, and through uh, either with purpose, Germany, uh, or through the positive uh, effects of the internal devaluation and the austerity packages imposed on the program countries, which, however, were able to compress wages and regain competitiveness. Of course, at social costs, because all this clearly created in the Euro periphery and to a certain extent also in Germany, the emergence of uh, populist uh, movements that then risk of derailing uh, the, the, let's say, the, the, the train in, uh, in 2019, something that didn't happen. Uh, so uh, Europe had an export-led EU growth out of the financial crisis, but this export-led EU growth was clearly at risk at the end of 2019 uh, because of a number of shocks that were hitting uh, uh, the world economy. Essentially, um, the, the end of uh, the multipolar world that uh, the Trump administration in the US was dictating uh, the tariff escalation uh, that followed, uh, the uncertainty on the rule system within the WTO with uh, the um, uh, blocking of uh, the uh, dispute settlement mechanism essentially by, again, the United States. All this uh, was clearly putting pressure uh, on this export-led uh, EU growth model to the point that uh, because of this external and extreme reliance on export and because of the fact that uh, the country that was absorbing all the exports of the world, namely the United States, stopped absorbing them to the pace that was consistent with uh, the EU uh, export-led uh, model, uh, clearly that reflected into lowering growth rates uh, for the most important exporting country. Uh, this is uh, the end of 2019 growth rates uh, for the top uh, two exporting countries in, in Europe, Germany and Italy. Now you can say that Italy having a 0.1 growth rate uh, might be due to all the problems associated to the government uh, and the governance uh, of economic policy in Italy, but a 0.5 growth rate in Germany clearly signaled not a lack of competitiveness, but simply a lack of demand from the rest of the world. So uh, Europe had to start uh, thinking at uh, a new model of growth already in 2018, uh, 2019, because the world was changing with respect to what, has been, what, what was the five years of expansion that followed uh, the, the, the debt crisis. And uh, clearly, uh, the only way and the only direction in which uh, the European Union could make this uh, growth model more consistent with this institutional model was uh, not uh, pressing on monetary policy because monetary policy was already at the limit of the action. Quantitative easing was already in place. Interest rates were already at the zero lower bound, but clearly uh, exploiting uh, the room of maneuver of fiscal policy that was largely left untouched during uh, the expansion of the 2014-2019. The Juncker Commission supported private investment, but it was never able to agree on uh, a major European common uh, investment plan, if you want, on public money. So uh, how to make this call for more public spending uh, consistent with the growth model and uh, with the political consensus? Well, at that moment, uh, the green option was clearly the most obvious one not only for the ethical and social uh, reason that, that uh, Ricardo very well explained, uh, but also from an economic point of view, uh, because uh, spending money on uh, greening the economy means uh, stimulating investments, means stimulating technological progress in an industry where Europe is already at the forefront with many uh, companies 
of the technology frontier of the world. But also, uh, why this is a silver bullet? Because it was politically feasible uh, pushing for public money going in that direction. Why so? Because uh, this is the lower bound of interest rate and the room of maneuver that we had uh, on, on fiscal policy. Why so? Because the green were the second most important party in Germany after the European elections, and the Greens were the third most important party in France after the European elections. So clearly, uh, there was a, a easy, if you want, or fortunate momentum in which, uh, social, let's say, ethical reasons, cleaning the environment, preserving sustainability, preserving the war for the next generation. Economic reason need to spend money on public investment, on new technologies, on strengthening TFP in order to change the driver of growth of the EU before insofar being mainly export led. And the political momentum, having the consensus. Mr. Macron, if he wants to be reelected, he has to win the support of the Greens. The CDU, if he wants to win election, they have to have the support of the Greens. So the two ruling governments in France and Germany clearly needed the support of the Green Party in perspective. And here you have uh, the new Green Deal by Ursula von der Leyen announced in parliament uh, at the day of her election as president, pushed by the France and German government mostly, uh, or through the alliance between the liberals, the socialists and the conservatives and the EPP, of course, uh, as the new, uh, uh, let's say, uh, kid on the block of uh, the EU budget. So these are the economic uh, and political consideration behind uh, the Green Deal, which then uh, fortunately also coincide with uh, a number of very good uh, uh, policy developments uh, uh, in, at the world level and, uh, uh, and with, a, if you want, uh, what I can call a categorical imperative to, to, to do better and to do and to act now for the future of, of our world and for our next generations. Then the COVID uh, shock came and uh, the COVID shock, you have to ask, okay, is it consistent with the Green Deal? Uh, for a number of reasons, it is. Why? Well, because uh, if anything, COVID is slowing down globalization. So you're putting even more pressure on a German-led, uh, export-led uh, growth model. Uh, the COVID shock forces and has forced uh, Germany uh, to think inwardly towards uh, the European internal market as the uh, only source of uh, uh, growth uh, that they could uh, hinge on in order to prosper in the future. There is a, an interesting uh, fact that happened uh, in April this year. Um, Italy, France and Spain were in lockdown and their electricity consumption was clearly falling 20, 30, 40% compared to the same period of the year before. Uh, week after week, uh, as long as they were moving into the lockdown, the German electricity consumption for the entire month of March stayed stable because Germany had a light lockdown, as we all know, in the first phase of the COVID shock. But then all of a sudden, end of March, early April, if you look at the German electricity consumption with the same lockdown light, it, flow, it falls to minus 30, minus 40%, similar to Italy, Spain, and France. Why so? Because simply German companies stop producing because they don't have the market. Spain, France, and Italy are closed. And the inputs, Spain, France, and Italy are closed. So Germany realizes with the COVID shock that uh, they cannot make a way without uh, uh, the single market and decides to invest heavily, therefore, on the single market because the alternative is simply not there, the export to the rest of the world. So in that sense, uh, the political uh, incentives uh, of COVID uh, make much more sense in the sense that uh, are consistent with the idea of uh, having a program of uh, expanded of public policy uh, related to the greening of uh, the EU economy. Also, uh, it is consistent with the idea of uh, revamping uh, and uh, recovering, to use the words, growth. 
And uh, in the future, if you think for the next generation, as Ricardo has clearly shown, uh, the Green Deal is also useful to make the economy more resilient to, to future shocks. So in a way, uh, COVID was, if anything, just the additional icing on the cake of uh, uh, the economic and political background, which was favorable for the development of uh, the EU Green Deal. And in fact, as Ricardo has uh, reminded us, 30% uh, uh, of the money of the budget, the recovery fund goes into uh, the new Green Deal. Now, having said this and having therefore clearly, I mean, I've been trying to explain why uh, COVID is, uh, is an important, uh, uh, if you want, uh, the, sorry, the Green Deal, even in a post-COVID environment is an important uh, tool for economic policy, uh, which is, I think, a nice combination of going back to, to your question, whether it's in, you know, a public or private, I think it will be a nice combination of, uh, of public and private money. That they, these are typical cases where there are some market failures that have to be fixed with public money, where, for example, the, the, the public money can be used as a first loss absorption. And then if uh, the reform, uh, if the, the regulatory framework is clear enough, private money kicks in and that makes the resilience part uh, of the story. So I think it's a nice combination of both type of policies, if properly done, but I have no doubt that it will be properly done also because the recovery fund, uh, the recovery plan, uh, the national recovery plan require exactly these steps, not only the public investment, but also the, the reform framework to make sure that then the private capital can flow. And this is why I believe personally, we're in Italy, Italy is uh, behind schedule on the, the, on the national recovery plan, not on the expenditure part, not on the investment part. I'm sure that they are fixing and putting the money where the commission wants the money to be, but they are behind schedule in making sure that this investment goes coupled with the reform that are necessary for this money to be effective uh, and for the private capital to follow the public money in order to you know, multiply the value of those investments, open and close the parentheses. We might go back uh, with questions on this point. Uh, so having said this, so having said that COVID and the response of European response to COVID, the recovery resilience facility, and is perfectly consistent with the, the Green Deal. What are the risks that I see uh, in um, the execution of such a plan? I see an external risk and an internal risk. Uh, the ex and then I stop because of time. Um, the, the external risk uh, is associated to the fact that uh, a working, uh, truly working and effective uh, uh, growth boosting uh, um, Green Deal for European firms requires a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, Ricardo mentioned it. So it requires that no company that does not comply with the environment regulation is authorized to make business on the European single market. So there can be no uneven playing field where Chinese company can pollute at home, gain in terms of cost through this pollution and use this gain to be competitive in the European market where our companies are forced to follow higher standards. So we need to have a carbon border adjustment mechanism of some sort. Now, Rebus Sextantibus, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is not uh, compliant with WTO regulation. So what we are saying is that by pushing the EU Green Deal, we, were, we are exposing ourselves to the risk of tariffs imposed to us by China and the US. I'm not saying that we will end up there. I'm not saying that there are no ways out of it, but I'm saying that there is this risk and we have to be very, let's say, um, secure, uh, we're very hard, hardly convinced that this is the way to go and very, if you want, compact as countries without countries pulling out of the game because they risk that if the US or China imposes tariff on German car exports, then Germany walks out of the deal. Uh, or if uh, the US imposes tariffs on French wine, then France walks out of the deal of the carbon border adjustment mechanism or dilutes the deal to the point that uh, uh, the deal is not effective. So this is the first risk, an external risk. 
uh, it requires a very strong and determined strategic autonomy of the EU uh, in the area of uh, trade policy, irrespective of the interests of single national member states. Uh, are we there? I don't know. Second point, there is an internal uh, risk, uh, which is the risk of even more uh, divisions in our societies. COVID will be a giant shock. We have seen nothing of what COVID will be for our societies because insofar no company can go bankrupt by law, uh, no, people, no person can be fired by law, uh, but sooner or later this will end. And therefore we will see the burden of uh, a 10% of GDP loss on the shoulder of people not equally distributed. Those who are digitally, let's say, uh, savvy, digitally educated, are not going to suffer from the COVID shock. Those who are not digitally educated or do not work in digital intensive industries are going to suffer a lot from the COVID shock. Typically, these are the same person that suffer from the globalization shock. And these are the same person that can suffer from the greening shock. Because what we are telling them now is that not only your job uh, was not uh, competitive enough with China, not only your job is digital enough to survive the COVID shock, your job is also not green enough to survive. Uh, so there is a clear risk uh, that uh, not being very careful in imposing this new regulation, uh, not being very careful in the type of transition instrument that Europe is putting together, and they are putting together, but I'm wondering whether this is enough, uh, we create new divisions in our societies, which is not what we cannot afford, not after such a crisis of this type of magnitude, which for sure will be, uh, let's say, will, will, will impose a, a very strong burden on the shoulder of those that are less equipped to deal uh, with, this, uh, with this type of shocks. I mean, uh, if I ask everyone to buy a new hybrid car, uh, I am imposing a regressive tax on those people who cannot afford uh, an hybrid car, essentially. If I increase uh, the price uh, of diesel fuel, uh, I am imposing uh, a, a regressive tax on those who cannot change uh, their diesel car. This already created the protest movement of the Gilets Jaunes in France. And so we have to be very careful in imposing this. Uh, this can be clearly second order effects in terms of magnitude compared to the first order effect of the positive innovation that comes from the Green Deal. But we have already made this mistake once with globalization, uh, ignoring or, or undervaluing the second order effects. And we risked the, the populist wave in Brussels. We shouldn't do the same mistake twice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, oh, sorry. Th thank you very much, really, for this uh, again another excellent presentation about the, the foundations of of really the, the, the whole in European initiative. Really, has been, has been really very great. Uh, I love it uh, as well. Um, so let's let's move let's move to the first speaker. We are running a little bit out of time, but uh, so Fernando Fernando Valera, for you is. Now it's a bit to talk about this uh, kind of the final final point said by by Carlos. So about this the social implications. This all this will be opportunity for a new economy. The economy will be more sustainable, inclusive, or the opposite. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, uh, we, uh, this could happen. Which are the challenges? Which are the proposals for a better economy from society? Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Luis, and uh, thank you also uh, to the uh, Fondazione per la Sociedad Direta for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to share this session also with uh, uh, Ricardo and, and Carlo. Uh, I'm going to share uh, the presentation. Hopefully, it's going to run. It's okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, well, I, I, 
I think uh, this is a big opportunity for a better economy, more sustainable and, and inclusive. Um, I, um, I think uh, um, the transition to a more sustainable and inclusive economy, it is, uh, 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 it is in the Green Deal. And if you uh, review uh, the, the communication from the European Union, it says uh, very clearly that the general objective of the Green Deal is to go in these directions towards a new economy uh, more sustainable and, and inclusive. No? So I'm, I'm going to, to reflect uh, uh, a little on the, the capacity to achieve these uh, results and the possibilities to really uh, make this transition to a, a better economy. Uh, but let us, let us start by, by the beginning. And I would like to mention uh, what is the origin of the Green Deal. And uh, Ricardo and Carlos said uh, some, uh, some, uh, some points. But I would like to mention uh, these uh, factors that uh, I think uh, they, they are behind the, the Green Deal. Uh, first, the loss of global positioning and competitiveness of uh, Europe. And uh, Carlo mentioned this uh, slowdown of the European communi uh, uh, community and the, well, the, the need uh, for a new competitive advantage uh, for Europe. No? And sustainability production was a good possibility. Also, to take advantage of the third industrial revolution, uh, we are immersed in a new digital uh, area and uh, there will be uh, many opportunities and, and benefits uh, from from this uh, industrial revolution and the, the three uh, big uh, uh, powers in the, the world compete in order to to be uh, at the first uh, uh, um, position in this uh, in this competition no? these are economic reasons uh, but there are there is also a, uh, other other reason as uh, uh, environmental reasons. Uh, uh, as you know, we were suffering. Uh, we we are still suffering from uh, planetary tensions, and I have to to talk about uh, climate change, uh, pollution, the problem of waste, the scarcity of natural resources, biodiversity affectation, migrations, and also uh, social, uh, a global social demand. And uh, we saw um, last year many uh, demonstrations at a global scale, uh, mainly led by young people demanding a new economy with uh, uh, better uh, results uh, in terms of uh, environmentally and, and socially. So, I think uh, there were these kind of motivations uh, behind the, uh, the, the, the Green Deal. And, and the answer, which is the Green Deal, I think uh, uh, it, it gives uh, answer for this, uh, for this motivation. No? So, so we could say that uh, Green Deal is a very good news for, for the economy. No? It is an, uh, a really an ambitious and political bet. No? It is a revolution in the right uh, direction. It means uh, a change of political orientation and availability of funding to implement it. Well, it, it is a Keynesian uh, approach, increase investments uh, for revitalizing the, the economy. And it is aligned with the 2030 agenda, the, the SDGs. So uh, we could say that uh, also the social uh, agenda is included in the Green Deal, no? or at least in the speech it is, it is included. And um, if you read the, the communication, it is established that the SDG, the SDGs, the, the 2030 agenda is uh, the, the horizon of the, of the Green Deal. No? So uh, the only thing I, could, I can say it is that are good news for an economy with a strong structural problems so, so that's it. Oh, uh, I think uh, Green Deal is a clever strategy, allows a better position and, and competitiveness uh, for, for our economy, avoid additional cost. Uh, and I am um, thinking in 
all the environmental impacts and also health impacts for having a, a bad uh, uh, environment. It is coherent with European values and also it has the capacity for influencing international markets due to the size of uh, the, the European economy. Well, uh, this uh, represents a huge transformation of economy and uh, I am not going to go uh, in, in deep in this because uh, Ricardo already uh, reviewed all the, all the policies. Uh, but I would like to mention also that uh, apart from the, the policies included in the, in the Green Deal, there are other complementary measures which are very interesting as well. For instance, this transformation of, of the financial sector uh, uh, um, through the, um, the, 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 the action plan for sustainable uh, finance, which is uh, a very important effort, uh, uh, regulation effort and all other incentives in order to promote uh, more, more focus of the industrial in, uh, uh, financial industry towards sustainability. Also innovation, uh, uh, innovation uh, programs, which are very important also the orientation of national budgets towards uh, sustainability, uh, support of uh, the transformation of the workforce, uh, and this uh, mechanism of just transitions in order to avoid uh, those affected uh, uh, for the low uh, carbon, uh, for the carbon transitions. So um, a good range of, uh, of measures, regulations, strategies, investments, standardization, tax incentives, innovation, international cooperation uh, with the general objectives of uh, promoting this transformation of economy. So until here, I think all uh, are good uh, news. I would like to mention some, uh, some challenges uh, uh, in this uh, transition. We we start by having a consistent framework, which is a very good news, but uh, the challenge is the implementation. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility of implementation uh, falls in, uh, in member states. Uh, the question is, are the member states ready to implement uh, such a uh, big investment in the economy? Or a key aspect is uh, the design of uh, programs uh, if uh, all the environmental and social criteria are included, uh, well included in the, in the design, which is a, a very important uh, uh, aspect. There is a risk of uh, low execution of, of programs. And uh, there, there, there are some doubts uh, between the, the scientific uh, uh, community uh, on if the, the fight against climate change will be sufficient in order to maintain the, the, temper, the planet temperature at this, uh, at this level. So the, there, is a, there is a challenge there. And at, until now, the agenda is mostly green. Uh, and Ricardo uh, told uh, before about the, the taxonomy, which is a, taxon a green taxonomy. But uh, what about the social agenda? What about the social taxonomy? Uh, this is something important to not to forget. And the, the adequate implementation of just transition mechanism is it is a challenge uh, without doubt. And this uh, objective of influencing international markets and commerce, this it is a, a real challenge, and it. Um, uh, needs uh, a strong policy coherence uh, to, to implement. So there are some uh, important challenges in order to uh, implement uh, and achieve the, the results and objectives uh, for, for CIM. So very good news, but uh, some aspects to take into consideration. Um, we need to go forward in measuring the social and environmental impacts of uh, companies. 
facilitating to consumer information on social environmental performance of companies and products and giving advantage to new business and economic models more sustainable. Uh, I'm going to make a, a short reflection on, on these topics in the next uh, slides. Um, and I start by this, uh, the, the, the present context. You know, we, we have, uh, let's say, uh, a big uh, number of conventional enterprise. Uh, this is the, the norm uh, now. What uh, produces uh, a considerable a negative impact in, uh, in society. Uh, so we would like to, to, to go to, to transit to our context of the side future. Uh, in which uh, the, the norm is uh, the sustainable enterprise uh, or even a more social enterprise with better impact uh, on, uh, on society. So how can we make this transition apart? Uh, 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 well, I, I would like to mention uh, different uh, ways uh, to make this transition to sustainable business models uh first uh, incentivizing public policies and all the green deal uh let's say it's uh, it could be categorized like like this uh, incentivizing public policies so this uh, could um, produce uh, sustainable companies are promote and a more sustainable and inclusive economy but there is another way and there is another vector of transformation, not only the influencing uh, the, the influencing of uh, of the public policies, are the the, uh, the consumer power of purchase, which is uh, very important. No? And what it is needed, uh, it is more information for the consumer in order to be able to uh, make um, choices on sustainable products and and companies. No? So Green Deal includes uh, some uh, actions on, on this, uh, trying to improve more uh, information for, for consumers. So these uh, are also with, uh, good news. So that will um, uh, uh, allow the consumer to really uh, exercise, uh, exercise uh, his uh, power of purchase uh, choice. So, well, this uh, this um, there is another another third uh, way of uh, promoting a sustainable business models, and this is uh, uh, all realities that uh, now are in the market, and they are uh, initiative, uh, private initiatives, some from the civil society. Uh, uh, putting in the market new business models better oriented to sustainability and common good uh, and common good. So these are realities interesting. Uh, I'm going to mention some of them uh, right now. Uh, and they uh, the, um, I, uh, the 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 um, the contribution of these uh, realities is that they. Um, they produce, they, uh, they develop uh, business models with a better balance between economic, uh, environmental, and social dimensions. So um, the first two ways of uh, uh, producing these uh, sustainable business models, uh, we, call, we could uh, categorize as uh, system correction. Huh? And the, the third one, it would be more uh, different uh, ways of uh, doing business, so we will categorize like a, like a new system. So now I'm going to show you some uh, uh, of these uh, realities that are already in the market. Some of them uh, for many years, uh, social and solidarity economy. Uh, some some more new, uh, like a common good economy, and uh, this one, for instance has been recognized by the European uh, Parliament as uh, being uh, an interesting contribution for, for Europe. All uh, the movement of companies B Corp or the communion economy uh, also. 
Uh, this is um, more from the social side of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of this uh, initiative, but uh, from the point of view of uh, environment, uh, apart from the circular economy, that it is included in the, in the, um, in the Green Deal, and it is uh, really a, a revolution in the industry. Uh, we find the regenerative economy or the commons or the all the reality of uh, epic uh, banking and sustainable finance. No? So these are really uh, realities that uh, uh, contribute in a, in, and, and, and I think it is interesting to know a little more because they uh, really um, uh, contribute uh, uh, to a new way of doing things uh, uh, as business models. Well, uh, finally, I have to say that uh, we need to measure companies in social and environmental dimensions. This is something already done by the financial industry. The uh, financial industry has recognized that uh, environmental and social risk are, are important for, for investment and they measure uh, the, 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 the environmental and social performance of company. They use uh, uh, ratings agencies that uh, analyze a big universe of companies in, uh, in Europe and uh, they differentiate uh, investment taking into account these kind of uh, factors. So that this will be interesting if we want to transit to a an economy more environmental, uh, more sustainable and, and social, uh, it is important to go forward in measuring also uh, uh, the, the performance of uh, companies. So thank you. Uh, this is um, uh, what I would like to say for, for finalizing my presentation. It is that the, the future is not well written. We have uh, a good uh, framework, interesting framework uh, to go towards a better economy, but it depends on us and we need to uh, make a big effort in order to uh, really implement, uh, to, to tackle all the challenges of the Green Deal in order to achieve finally uh, these uh, expected results and uh, to make a, a real uh, transformation of the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fernando. Uh, thank you again for this, uh, another really very good presentation with a very, a very complementary to the other two ones. I think we have managed to have a, a great set of free, free presentations. Really, we don't have much time for, for, for debate, but of course we want to have some, some debate and interact if possible. Perhaps we are not going to be able to to finalize at the uh, at the uh, six thirty as pro as promised, but perhaps well, depending on the questions, we can extend a little bit, or maybe it's not necessary. So just just let's just open the floor for other participants, uh, reactions, or questions. So um, let's see if I can see the any hand that is. Uh, I don't know. Well, I have a question, if I, if I may. Sure. Please, uh, thanks. Uh, well, first of all, I really uh, thank you all for uh, for this uh, for this uh, truly excellent presentation and uh, consideration. Now, I, I have a question, and, and the same for for all of you. Uh, Ricardo, you said that uh, seventy-seven percent of uh, uh, the public opinion, if I well remember, thinks that the, the protection of the environment uh, will strengthen, will boost uh, uh, the economic growth. And uh, and all of you, uh, all of you, underline that, that you believe in this in this uh, possibility. Um, well, as we all know, uh, this is not automatic. Uh, and, uh, and you have also underlined this in, in different ways. Uh, well, this is not automatic and it depends on the channels through which uh, uh, environmental protection will be uh, promoted. And, uh, and, and it's not said that the measures uh, envisaged uh, 
can really push uh, in this direction. But um, even more than this, uh, which is in any case, which is uh, I mean, in any case under discussion, uh, well, we are also interested uh, that the transition can also uh, really help to, to rebalance uh, uh, the imbalances and inequalities uh, uh, that the different territories uh, have been uh, um, experiencing in a recent uh, decades. And uh, from uh, this point of view, I don't know how, if and how adequate uh, the measures uh, already planned uh, are. Uh, they, they risk going uh, in a direction that, uh, that risks uh, absorbing uh, many resources and being far uh, from uh, being in line uh, with, the, uh, with the subsidiarity uh, culture uh, that aims to enhance the role of the actors of the territory, uh, public or private, uh, profit or non-profit, uh, whatever they, 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 they are, they may be. Um, so what do you think about this? Thank you very much, Alberto. So I let you to any of you. The question is open for the three of you. So if I can uh, intervene uh, right now, if you don't mind, because then I have uh, to go. Unfortunately, I have another webinar. <laughs> Today is a busy day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry for that, because it, I would really love to, to keep on discussing this. So I'm very sorry if, uh, if I have to go. But uh, I was. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the organizers uh, knew this. No, so uh, very quickly, Alberto, thanks for the question. I think this is the crucial element. I would be separate my answer in two. On the one hand, there is the, let's say, uh, if you want, uh, um, first order condition, that is the, to the, what extent uh, this transition generates growth and resources that then can be redistributed in order to compensate second order effects uh, that are the disparities that then uh, will take place. Um, paradoxically, if you allow me, uh, we had this discussion this morning in a project uh, uh, I'm following for the European Commission with other scholars on um, productivity distributions, growth and the EU social model. Um, and paradoxically, it, 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 it turned out that we are all now scared about the second order effects uh, so the redistributional consequences and to what extent uh, uh, these are going to be uh, serious and to what extent this is going to generate a backlash in terms of uh, uh, political resentment uh, and things like that. Um, in, now we are well, well, much bet, better equipped on this. We have better data. We know firm level data, workers data, workers firm level data. So we do now know a lot of things about the distributional consequences. And I think the European Commission is also pretty much aware of this and the European budget has been putting money on this just transition fund, which are in the tens of billions of euros. So uh, there is this awareness. Where I'm a bit more worried is exactly what you said at the beginning. And to what extent are we sure that this green transition is going to promote growth and productivity? So which uh, we give it for granted in a way, like we say, okay, trade creates growth, automation creates growth, green transition creates growth. Wait a second, to what extent uh, uh, green transition creates growth is something that probably we need to study uh, a bit more. And um, what I find interesting is that uh, something that Ricardo mentioned, I think is very important. Maybe Ricardo, you want to follow up on this. It is this taxonomy that the EU came up with, which is a huge, huge effort, uh, more than one year of work uh, in, in clarifying uh, what is green, what is brown, I think they use, and what is uh, not green, uh, with scientific basis, of course. And this taxonomy is entering now also into finance. So uh, there is now all this ESG uh, movement that Fernando was discussing. And through this taxonomy, basically private capital can enter truly green or brown investment. And therefore there is now compared to the past, uh, a link between uh, market forces, finance, even bank supervision. I mean, the Bank of England has been the first to say that if we do believe that uh, ESG assets are more reliable, more stable, more secure, less volatile, 
then we should give uh, a risk weight to ESG assets, which is lower compared to other type of assets, which implies that this will be suited capital by, by banks and financial corporation, which activates a virtuous circle uh, in this type of green transition, because then the, the, the real market forces will be able to evaluate what is green and what is the marginal return on this. So on this, I'm uh, kind of more optimistic because we now have this positive link between uh, uh, private investment and finance, which however can be also very dangerous if the taxonomy goes in the wrong direction, because we know that then we tend to exacerbate. So it's not really, I don't have a firm answer on the first uh, part of the of the story, but I know that things look better than in the past, but we really have to monitor the process very closely. And I'm very glad that you raised uh, this point. Thank you. And sorry if I have to go. I would love to hear the answer of the other, but uh, I have to go. No problem. Thank you. Carlo, thank you very much for your, for, for your participation. Thank you, Carlo. Bye -bye. We are already at the time. We expect it to finalize, but we, I, I think we may continue just a few minutes more. Perhaps before before giving the floor to you, Ricardo and Fernando, perhaps before that we can give the room for any, if there is any other, one or two more inter, interventions from, from the other participants, and then you may, you may reply to those and even to this one. So any other intervention or reaction at this, at this stage? I have a question, if I may. Sure, Paula. Um, Go ahead. Hi, hello, and thank you for your presentations that were really, I mean, thought provoking, all the three uh, speeches. I mean, <clears throat> my question is on a more um, micro level um, uh, the kind of implications um, this deep transformation may have for. Uh, the firm level, basically, because my, I mean, as far as I can understand what green transformation is, um, there are many, many details that, uh, so let's call them details, that need to be uh, put in place in order to have this uh, change at the industry and firm level. So think of uh, uh, operational processes within the companies uh reshaping of uh, supply chains and so on and so far and uh, uh, in my i mean um, my, my understanding about the role of subsidiarity is uh, uh, the fact that uh, for sure what uh, uh, ricardo uh, said about uh, uh, say the voice of uh, civil society, but um, also the fact that uh, this transformation in order to occur uh, requires uh, that uh, um, people, I mean, workers, managers um, have, uh, I mean, uh, competences on the one hand to do that and motivations. I, I, I believe that, I mean, for sure, um, economic incentives, fiscal measures are necessary and also the right kind of regulations. But without this kind of, say, intrinsic motivations, uh, this change will not occur or will take, I mean, I, I, I'm afraid that it can take the, the, the wrong direction, if you like. So, um, I mean, subsidiarity and uh, the kind of education of uh, um, people, uh, the human of persons, human, uh, the kind of human capital, also in terms of uh, what uh, uh, Giorgio um, is studying. So, uh, soft skills and non cognitive non cognitive skills are an important piece of the puzzle in my, uh, as far as I can understand, the transformation which is required. So more ah. comments, and also I would like to to hear your um, okay very view good. about that. Very good, Paula. Very good question. Uh, I, I like it. I, I think we can give perhaps a room for one more question or an intervention, and then we we just give the floor to Ricardo and Fernando. So any other comment, question, reaction? No. If, if not, then we can just, Ricardo, Fernando, you can comment on this. 
Uh, thank you for the all uh, say interesting uh, uh, questions indeed, which are indeed of the at the core of the of the problem. Um, it is clear that let's say this uh, this uh, uh, growth and this uh, transition is not uh, automatic. We say okay, green uh, deal, uh, green uh, recovery. Uh, but for the moment, we have mobilized, uh, let's say, um, financial support to support this uh, this uh, uh, this movement. But it will require, uh, let's say, huge uh, changes. Therefore, there are sure some risk, and the risk, which I think has, <coughs> uh, has been uh, mentioned by um, Bognoli uh, in question, is imbalance in the different territories, in balance also in our societies, because in our societies, also in our countries, there are the capability to uh, adapt are uh, different, the different level. And therefore, I think the idea of, let's say, uh, supporting, it's absolutely, let's say, the support with kind of uh, tool, the kind, the kind of transition uh, mechanism which the parliament have uh, wanted to as, uh, increase also in uh, comparison with what was previously foreseen. I think we've been now around, let's say, 25 billion. But I think we have, when you talk about this system, we have also to talk to a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, multiplier effect, because I think even a very ambitious plan like this will not, let's say, address all these possible potential imbalances. Therefore, indeed, there is a question, therefore, I think is not obvious. Must, must be, uh, uh, let's say, accompanied by very active uh, uh, changes in the uh, model, and also in the uh, in the in the production. And there is also another risk uh, which has been always, I think, considered that uh, um, Italy, we, are, uh, we have mentioned, is Italy is a country having a lot of skills, a lot of resources, uh, um, uh, capability to embark in this kind of transition. But there are other countries. Let's take, for example, Poland, which are depending uh, very much on, let's say, fossil fuels energy, which will, let's say, uh, address uh, and face a much huger, let's say, uh, difficulties. We have also to uh, avoid, in terms of financing, we create a certain, let's say, disproportionate support for the countries which are more, let's say, behind with uh, this, uh, uh, with uh, adaptations and uh, 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 with uh, economic, uh, uh, ecological uh, requirements and just, uh, let's say, to uh, live in difficulties, countries which are already rather well developed, but still need a lot of, let's say, uh, resources of uh, uh, adaptation. Um, therefore, this, is also, this will be one of the key, uh, the key uh, challenge. Um, I uh, consider that uh, this answer, which has been given, I, I would say, uh, I, I was also myself surprised when I saw that the result was, so, say, so many, let's say, uh, people responded, let's say, in this very rather positive way with this idea. But I think it's also, um, I think, a, a question, I think, of, uh, of, uh, of mind, I think it will be possible if we want to make it possible, because it is also the, uh, uh, I think it depends very much what is our point of departure and how we see our global uh, environment. I mean, also not only in different member states, let's say in Italy, but also we see developments. We have been mentioned in Germany, I think Germany is uh, uh, promoting very uh, huge already adaptation to this kind of uh, of targets. Therefore, we have also to avoid when the, to uh, slow down our uh, let's say uh, transition uh, progress um, uh, and uh, to uh, let's say to be faced to a kind of competitive disadvantages. Also, China, which represents yet absolutely huge polluter in the world, is very quickly adapting and also they are um, making enormous investment in the green economy. Therefore, let's say the, afterwards, I think the competitivity in few years will be 
shifted, let's say, not to, will be not be represented to the ones who uh, produce more, let's say, uh, uh, with uh, uh, more uh, uh, use of natural resources and will produce maybe at the lowest, let's say, standard, but let's say the competition will be between the, those who have, uh, let's say, applied already uh, and have shown the capability to, uh, uh, to produce in uh, compliance with uh, the green uh, objectives. About, I mentioned uh, quickly, I mentioned indeed the, the taxonomy. The taxonomy is very uh, important because we are talking about green finance, which will also have a huge impact on all over Europe. Therefore, it means we are, uh, there are uh, different uh, requirements and uh, different areas which will be uh, considered as acceptable for um, uh, financing to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, provide financial uh, support to finance. But also there, and also I'm uh, talking in front of uh, economists, I think the methodology is very important. Uh, I think the European Commission is developing a kind of different uh, models. So it is very important, let's say, how this uh, the taxonomy and also the calculation takes place. Because you know, it depends very much on the parameter, finally, whether certain economic activity can be financed or, or not will be. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. On the uh, question I, <clears throat> I think raised by, uh, uh, by Paola, and also she addressed also the question of uh, human capital, and also in terms of uh, subsidiarity. I, I think that this process require a very in-depth involvement of the, let's say, um, of the people, of the different realities, of the economic actors, of the social actors. And I think it should not be just because, say, in principle, we are doing it already, and also at the European level, the consultation, so on. But I think this, uh, uh, the Green Deal, the Green Recovery, uh, requires also a change in the way we are also um, approaching the problems, but also in the way uh, European Union is legislating. You know, so far we had more or less, although with the different, let's say, consultations level, uh, a kind of top-down approach. I think we have to uh, move, and I think the Green Deal would be an opportunity to move a, another much more bottom-up approach. Is the reason why I think it's a, a crucial importance that now civil society in four is being involved, but they are not only theoretically involved, they are involved in this concept which I mentioned of the Green Pact, uh, will be very clear procedures to include to include the stakeholders, and it's also a very important part of this taxonomy for the challenges which exactly which I indicated. It means that uh, let's say indeed what is decided there will have a huge impact also sure on the uh, local realities on the territories and so on. On the human capital, also it requires, I think, uh, this uh, a, a, in parallel, if we want it, will be, a, 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 let's say, positive uh, development, and uh, let's say that the process will be successful, is absolutely uh, important to develop what we call the social pillar of the uh, European Union. Uh, we have so far talked about, let's say, the economic pillar, uh, but I think this social pillar will be absolutely important in the future, but this is also, let's say, the signal that uh, we get also from our uh, citizens, because I think a very uh, strong social measures have to accompany these green transitions, which uh, this is my last point, which cannot be separated for another major transition, which is the digital transition. And also we are very much on it. I think we know we will have huge number of jobs will be, become obsolete due to, let's say, <clears throat> this transition, which very often will interact very closely with the green transition, but will be a lot of new uh, work possibilities. It's been calculated that currently there are 350,000 
jobs now in let's say in Europe, which are for a kind of jobs which are let's say not uh, really uh, not finding really necessary uh, uh, trained uh, workers which represent, let's say, an opportunity at the same time for the future. I stop here for a moment. Yes. Yeah, I think, thank you very much, Ricardo. Very good comment. I think we are really now out of time. I don't know if, Fernando, you can just make a short intervention about some of the things we you have, because we have to conclude, I think. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very shortly. Um, no, I, I think uh, uh, European Union has uh, taken the, the right decision to go towards uh, sustainability as a way of competing in this world uh, because it will be difficult to compete in, uh, in, other, in other way. No? So the revolution is, uh, is uh, underway. Um, so I think uh, uh, people and companies, what uh, should do is to prepare for this uh, change that uh, will happen uh, uh, for, for sure. No? Um, what I, um, I think it is important to, to start uh, all, the, uh, all the training of the workforce in order to prepare it uh, for this uh, uh, transformation. All the industry, the companies should start to integrate uh, circular economy, etc., cetera, in, uh, in its uh, management and its value chains if they want to be prepared for the future. Otherwise, if they don't de do the, this uh, uh, as soon as possible, it is possible that they are going to find some barriers. Um, uh, they will be penalized or they will have more difficult access for, for financing, uh, et cetera. No? So, so as soon as uh, this uh, process is started uh, in the companies and personally, um, the, the workforce, I think it, it would be the, the, the better. But uh, anyway, uh, I am worried about the social agenda. This is uh, called uh, the Green Deal and uh, everyone uh, puts the focus on the green side of the Green Deal. But if you read uh, the, the communication, uh, the social aspects are, are included. Uh, the SDGs are included. So I, I think we should uh, demand uh, not forget uh, this social uh, side because uh, these revolutions uh, will uh, uh, produce uh, some impacts, uh, important impacts in, in people and, uh, and industry. So it is, it is very important to, to manage uh, this in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way in order to avoid uh, uh, let's say uh, important damage uh, for people and, and companies. No? Thank you very much. No? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Carlo. Really, I think this has been really a, a very, very good uh, uh, workshop. I think at least I learned a lot. I think you have been really uh, teaching us a lot about, about what's going on on this uh, Green Deal uh, and Green Recovery Agenda. Uh, I think we have answers to questions, but we have a lot of new questions. I think that is what is always good. I think you have given us a lot of things to to to, to be more, you know, to think more about. No, uh, in particular about this second order effects of people excluded, the social agenda, these these things you have been talking about now, uh, the the skills, the capacity. So many many questions. The subsidiarity that you Ricardo started to talking about uh, about. And this is really the core also of the of the activities of the uh, subsidiarity foundation. So how how all this is going to affect the subsidiarity and the other way around? How subsidiarity really can help to build uh, to build really this this agenda? I also have questions about the the capacity of the European Union to be a union, not to be a group of selfish. Uh, national interest group together in order to get some some revenue but really to make a real union uh, and i really wonder if if that union will prevail over the vested interests of different nations and different populations in, in different countries but there is also another question really big question for me um uh, i don't know what's going to be the future but but what is clear is that it's very very challenging uh, agenda we have ahead of us um, and for me, at the end of the day, this question of 
of, of, the, of taking care of the planet, of the sustainability, of the green recovery, has a lot to do to the awareness of being in the same in the same boat. We are in the middle of a storm with different things, uh, as we all know. Um, and now is so the, the the care about the the planet, the care about the sustainability, about the green, uh, um, is is a way to really to be more aware of uh, the gift we have received in, in our lives. So the gift of the planet, the gift of the of the natural resources we have. I, as, as well as the gift of the people we work with, we live, we work, we love. Uh, so I think this this there is a continuum on the on the recognition of of the gift that is given to to, to the system of the planet and, and the and this, uh, um, I, and the gift that people we live with and we live for uh, is also uh, in this in this in the same boat. I think this this continuous awareness in between the is, is what makes even the Green Deal more important because then it's, a, it's an opportunity also to be more aware of, of the gifts we receive in life um, and, and also for societies to build economy in a different way, uh, away from the traditional model that is very narrow and now it's a way that is more inclusive, not only yeah, with, the, with the, or can be inclusive, not only with, with the people suffering more, but also with, with the whole, uh, whole uh, mindsets that are can, can have more a human a human dimension in it so um, i think that i really thank you very much for all of you for participating i don't know if there is an announcement or something that maybe alberto from the foundation or no i think not yeah it's okay no it's okay so well then thank you, thank very you much. so much uh, thank you so much ricardo fernando thank you so much and thank you luisa no Thank you, Alberto. thank you, Alberto. Has been really great to have the opportunity to organize it, to to share this, and and uh, Anel will will keep you informed of the future seminars. That we don't know, still don't know um, wow. when and where. Well, where <laughs> can be virtual again, but uh, no. <laughs> but let's hope that we can at least we'll be able to to continue organizing things and um, helping at each other to. To look at the economy and the reality in a in a way our heart wants, really in a human in a human way. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.